Hello and welcome to the presentation of the second issue of the Belarusian track of changes. Our today's speakers are Pavel Slunkin, who is a associate uh, visiting fellow of the European Council, Belarusian ex-diplomat, Artem Schreiben, who is founder and political analyst at the Sense Analytics. He writes about uh, inter uh, internal policy. Uh, Katerina Bornyukova, Academy Director at Biroc, Vincent Professor at Kellas Third University of Madrid. She'll be telling us about the foreign policy aspects. Lev Lvovsky, Senior Research Fellow at Biroc. Today, he'll be telling us about the internal economic trends. Filip Bikano, independent sociologist, will be tell us about the uh, society, civil society, and public opinions. And Gennady Korshinov, Program Director of Belarusian Academy, Senior Analyst at the Center for New Ideas. He'll be telling us uh, about the uh, particular changes in the military views of people. Uh, today, we'll have our speakers presenting the uh, results for five minutes. I'd like to ask our speakers to keep to the schedule and speak for five minutes. In the second hour, we'll have a Q&A session. I would like to remind you that your questions, you can send to our Zoom chat. I'll, I'll try to read them all today. Now we'll give floor to Valeria Klimenko. Valeria Klimenko, coordinator of the uh, Friedrich Edmund Ebert Foundation on behalf of Christopher First. I would like to welcome you at the presentation of the second issue of the Belgian Tracker of Changes. The Friedrich Ebert Foundation is the oldest political foundation in Germany whose work is aimed at promoting fundamental values of the social democracy and providing for peace and security in Europe and outside. We are glad to become a part of such a long-term uh, research project and we firmly believe that it is the in deep systemic analysis that is the first major step towards the Im important and necessary political changes inside the country. Today we present to you the second quarterly tracker. We have six people working on them who are the best in their spheres. They have been already introduced to us by Anton. He, they will tell us about the sustainable and long-term trends in Belarus over the last uh, three months, June, July, and August. Those of you, of you who are with us for the first time, is the analytical part uh, that is exclusive part of our research, is the survey that manages to understand the major trends in the Belarus society. I hope that uh, with time going on, our tracker will become a long-term project. I would like to thank all the experts for the partnership analytical work. I'd like to thank the press club for promoting the results of our work. I would also like to wish uh, Christopher Forst to uh, join us as soon as possible because he's now he's, uh, sick. And now I'll give floor to Anton. Thank you, Valeria. And let's move on towards the second issue of the Belgian Changes Tracker. So the first five minutes I given to five, Pavel Slunkin, who writes about the foreign policy in the Belarusian tracker. Thank you, Anton. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. First and foremost, I would like to uh, pay your attention to the fact that in our tracker, we only write about the things that happened in July. So we do not include uh, uh, any deoccupation of uh, the uh, Ukrainian parts of Ukraine, formerly occupied by Russia. Don't expect such an analytics in our report. We'll be telling you about what was happening in June, July, and August alone. So in the previous report, we noted that uh, after Russia uh, came to Ukraine, invaded Ukraine, Belarus was perceived differently. And there was uh, two major actors. 
the regime and the people. While before that, uh, there was only one actor, it's the regime. Now on the background of the new sanctions that could be put on the state authorities and uh, businesses loyal to state authorities. Um, it is the proposals that touch upon the lives of the ordinary people and those that receive more and more uh, attention. Among the initiators of that are the countries that have been sympathizing with the democratic Belarus for a long time. And one such things is the uh, issue with visas and non-issues of visas to Belarusian citizens and proposals in this respect. And many ways, the, uh, these alternative representatives of Belarus, democratic forces, they can work at in the international arena. Uh, the, we still don't see the Belarusians getting the visas. The second trend is the tension with Ukraine, which is still in place, even though the, the majority of the Russian forces have left Belarus, but there's still shelling of the Ukrainian territory from happening from the Belarusian territory. And Belarusian army was checked. Um, Ukrainian army was checked uh, for readiness to repel the potential invasion from the Belarusian side by the Belarusian army. Belarusian forces were mostly placed in the regular places of... Mm, at the same time, for four months, uh, a range of uh, military actions have been witnessed in the uh, uh, southern eastern parts of Belarus. And here I include regular uh, military forces and uh, the regular uh, citizenship. During this uh, exercises, they practice both attacking and uh, withdrawing. In the government region as well, there was control of the potential personnel, the number of people uh, who would join the Mobilization points were also checked. So raids were conducted in the parts of Belarus neighboring Ukraine. And they were trying to check the potential activists, opposition activists. We believe that this shows that uh, this dimension is seen by the Belarusian authorities, authorities as the potential source of threats and probably uh, they believe that there could be some tensions in the future. We also believe that there were no uh, steps as such over the period that were analyzed. Uh, we don't believe that the uh, Belarusian army will soon invade uh, Ukraine, according to our estimations. Even though uh, compared to the winter 22, those forces are more prepared to uh, join the battle, but I don't believe they're ready enough for that. Of course, the mobilization actions in Russia amended and changed the current situation. I will touch upon that later during the next presentation. The third trend in the foreign policy uh, area is the cooperation of Belarus with the occupied parts of Ukraine and Georgia. For the first time, Lukashenko recognized the independence of the uh, LNR and DNR, but at the same time, he noted that uh, to formalize this decision, uh, there's no reason of formalizing this decision. At the same time, there are regular meetings of representatives of the Belarusian regime with the representatives of the occupied uh, administrations. Former Justice Minister, who now worked in the uh, committee, they visited the Donetsk region and uh, spoke with the occupational forces. Victor Sheyman visited Abkhazia, where he 
met with representatives of the so-called president of Abkhazia, Abkhazia. In July, the governor of the Vitebsk region signed a memorandum of understanding and, and the DNR delegation also visited Belarus, where they met with the Belarusian local authorities. I will end by telling you about the trends that we noticed on the part of the democratic forces. The two major ones being that there was an interim committee and office created. I would call it the cabinet of a fourth scenario. And the participants and the members of the office, they all agreed that the peaceful means of of fighting and struggling with the Belarusian regime turned out ineffective. So it's normal now to prepare for the uh, forceful scenarios of overthrowing the current Belarusian authorities. So we believe it's there was the shift from context, from the peaceful to the um, forceful. The conference also showed there was a shift of Belarusian democratic forces from pro-Ukrainian positions that became uh, more active after Russia invaded Ukraine, but also towards the anti-Kremlin positions. So we see the trend that we described in the previous, our report, and here we'll give a quote from Valer Kabalevsky, who is representative of the uh, Office on Foreign Affairs. Well, he spoke that Russia is the enemy of Belarusian sovereignty and national identity. Even though previously, representatives of the Tikhanovsky's office uh, were not that harsh, now they they call Russia to be the clearly the enemy of the Belarusian uh, sovereignty and state. Thank you, Pavel. Was very interesting. I would like to give floor to Artem Scheidman, who spoke, uh, will tell us about the internal policy. Thank you. Uh, of course, I'll be talking about the summer trends as well, because this is the focus of our current survey. Here, just uh, in case of Pavel, many things are determined, were determined by the war in Ukraine and reaction of many actors to it. Broadly speaking, all democratic forces and uh, the authorities, they moved through the phase of the militarization. Inside of it, I would single out five trends militarization of the state apparatus, like the, when Lukashenko initiates militarization of the uh, previously civil uh, agencies. This way he prepares them for potential involvement of the military conflict. Uh, for example, the emergency forces, they were given uh, small arms and light weapons and were trained to use them. Also the creation uh, of the so-called militia. It was done so that people who are not, uh, who can hold weapons and would probably join uh, the people who protect in the state in many times. Could, they could be a, a factor that could repel uh, the potential enemy. Later, Lukashenko also ordered that the, about five people uh, that uh, work in the forest, like foresters, would be armed and uh, would be trained to use small arms and light weapons. And he, men he mentioned uh, the experience of Ukraine and not Russia. Another trend connected with the actions of the authorities is the furtherment of the repressive activities because in the before uh, it's Gennady Korshnov he will talk more about the repression but I believe uh, in my case the repression towards the media outlets uh, came into the new level meaning that uh, media that were not involved in the political activities or writing about the politics were now again affected like the dv.by uh, 
authorities and owners were arrested and abw.by were arrested and Ksatin Zlatich was also arrested. So we see that when the media space that was involved in politics was cleared, the authorities decided to tackle others. And of course, that Mr. Kuznetsuk from Radio Liberty was sentenced to six years. Others were sentenced to eight. Irina Slavniko from Belsat sentenced to five years in colony and Yegor Libedok was also detained. I think uh, he was one of the last experts who was not loyal to authorities and was still commenting on the trends. The third trend has to do with the general militarization and the repressive practices of the authorities. It is the mobilization of the pro-governmental community. It became, this trend became stronger in the summer. Propagandists became more involved in uh, promoting the agenda of the state. So uh, this, the Kalinovsky bar was closed. Bank in Butilki bar incident when the Okean Elzes song was sung, the singer was detained and the director of the bar was detained. Miriam Gersimenko is still in jail. And she was, we learned today that she was criminally charged. The story with Adam Maldis also comes to mind in the Astraviets library. After several months of pro-governmental activists like uh, Azarionek, Bondariva and others, and their actions, Adam Maldis' name, uh, books were removed from the library. So the propagandists uh, and their actions resulted in repressions in various spheres. For example, the, uh, the hospitality sphere and the story with tour guides, when propagandists became parts of the groups, they were taken around the city and they picked faults with the tour guides. So this was a coordinated activity was coordinated by the administration. And other uh, things, the signs of that appeared in the Grodno with the Olga Bondriva, got an argument with the, the local activists. And, and like the concert of the Filip Kerkorov, um, was subject to criticism and was almost cancelled. So we see that uh, this it's important to note that on the 6th of September, Lukashenko was speaking about amnesty. He said that there are people among his supporters who um, are doing it too, in, uh, too harshly and it brings disunity in the society. Still, he understands that among his supporters, there are more passionate people and less passionate people, and he needs to, to uh, cater for all of them. From the point of view of democratic forces, there's a clear cut trend of the second range opposition forces getting more active. For example, Tikhanovsky got more criticized and there was a conference uh, and the interim office appeared. Those additional reforms aimed at the coordination council. And there were a lot of questions asked to of the Tikhanovsky office. No clear cut consolidation was achieved, and the people like Tepkala, Balkonets, Olga Karaj, they continued to institutionalize their own structures separate from others. They held their own form of democratic forces. Despite the fact that 
many people think that they're marginal figures. I would not belittle their role as far as the launch of the reform of the democratic forces is concerned, because it started with their criticism. And the last trend is the radicalization of the opposition forces, positional forces. Pavel mentioned that it was clear, obvious to everyone uh, that the appointment of the two Siloviki representatives of the law enforcement people in the temporary committee on interim committee interim office of was aimed at the new scenario and it shows once again that the democratic forces are more more tolerant towards the uh, non the use of the non-democratic um, actions And you will learn from our fifth parts of the report more about that when Philip Bicano speaks. Thank you very much. We open in the economic block with Katerina Bornukova, who will touch upon foreign economic aspects. Thank you very much, everyone. I would like to welcome everyone, the foreign economic aspects had the same trends continue the cooperation with the eu continued at the same time the cooperation with russia was deepening and becoming more uh, wide belarus made a technical default and belarus managed to redirect some of its oh, unsanctioned sanctioned goods or find some loopholes for them. So Belarus continues to hide their data on foreign, uh, foreign trade figures. Less and less information is available to us. So we're trying to use the indirect figures or use the statistics of other countries like that of the EU. If we look at the joint trade with the EU, indeed the new packet of sanctions was introduced, the sixth one, Belarus was there, mentioned there, and one of the banks had SWIFT turned off and several companies that were previously subject to other kinds of sanctions were put on the sanctioned list, which makes theoretically more difficult for them to bypass sanctions. But I just wanted to show you how sanctions do work or do not work. What do you see in the picture? Each line shows the separate kinds of goods. We use the Eurostat data to make this graph. We don't get this data from Belarus anymore. It's the export from Belarus to EU, where 100 means the average level in the, of the first quarter of 2022. We look at the the biggest line, the largest line, we'll see that the second part of the 2021, despite the sexual sanctions, the general export figures were growing. Through the very good conditions for Belarus, the demand was growing and the and prices were growing. According to the EU data, the export of the oil products from Belarus to EU fell in July 22, moment instantly after the sanctions were introduced, although they were uh, had a long-term effect. And we see now that Belarus uh, ships almost no oil products to the EU currently. The same picture uh, can be seen in 2022. Many uh, sanctions were affected Belarus uh, just as when Russia invaded Ukraine in 2022, all sanctions were in full swing. We can see uh, it in the example of the wood processing industry and metal. So they stopped their exports to the EU and overall we look at the export to the EU in June, in June with the level of experts in January, we'll see there's a fall there of more than 50 percent. 
which means that the sanctions do work. But we also see the growth of export figures in other goods that are not under sanctions, like food products and the ele electronic goods, and electrical equipment. The figures of that to the EU is, are starting to grow. And we hear the government, particularly Lukashenko, saying that we shouldn't uh, uh, close our eyes to the EU market and we shouldn't disregard the EU market and we should continue working with them despite the sanctions. And we see the direct and indirect uh, proofs that uh, despite the sanctions, the trade is going on. The oil processing industry and judging by the salaries in this area, we see that starting from the summer, the situation in the oil processing industry and plants has become to become better. I don't know where the oil processing, where the final goods are going, because based on the EU figures, EU is not buying those uh, products from Belarus, but if it did happen, uh, that will be done through some third country. At the same time, we see that there's agreements with Russia that will allow to ship the Belarusian potassium and three to four million tons of potassium will be shipped through the Belarusian ra Russian railways and Russian ports. This is from one fourth to one third of the regular amount. It's still not enough, not, not big enough figures, but it's still not nothing. It's interesting to see the influence of sanctions, which is possible because the financial sanctions made it impossible to make payments on foreign debt and Ministry of Finance decided to pay the debt in Belarusian rubles. Moreover, they decided to do it to use the Belarus bank accounts, which means that the rating agencies uh, said that Belarus was in default. Unfortunately, it will have long-term consequences for Belarus, which closes financial international markets for Belarus, despite the sanctions. And just a couple of words about how we develop our cooperation with Russia. We see that the export towards Russia is growing. We, at the moment, cannot explain how and by what commodities is growing. Is it by sheer volume or just by price hikes? We have the right to consider that the price hike plays an important role here because the prices for the goods transported to Russia are growing. We also have seen that we have 14 import substitution projects that Russia is expected to finance. But for the 14 projects, uh, we're talking about indistinguishable amount of one and a half billion dollars and so far no official agreements have been signed and finally we are negotiating the construction of a terminal or a port at one of the russian seas and here the situation is constantly changing again and there are no final agreements seen or heard of that's it thank you very much thank you katerina and the domestic economic trends will be continued by Lvov, Lev Lvovsky. Hello, everyone. As far as the domestic economic trends are concerned, I have distinguished four of them. The main one is that GDP continues to decline. It continues to decline at a much quicker rate than in spring. The numbers are minus 7.3 in June, minus 10 point one percent in July and minus three percent in August. At the same time, I must note that the July and August numbers have been significantly distorted because of the uh, shift of the time of harvesting. If we readjust for that, uh, then we'll get uh, more even numbers. This way we can so far temp tentatively say that the uh, decline rate has slowed down, but it continues. It is accompanied by the drop in real 
wages, real wages have dropped by 5.9% than a year before. The most significantly, we see the drop in wages in such industries which are affected by sanctions mostly. One of the strongest drops in wages have been seen in the potash industry. The same was true about oil refineries, but the oil refineries, as Katerina mentioned, uh, have managed to cope with that. Perhaps the most unusual and interesting trend is in the wage drop, is the wage drop in IT sector. Uh, we're not only talking about the uh, wage drop in IT, but also the added value in IT, whereas the average growth rate of IT sector was 8% initially at the beginning of the summer, it slowed down to only 1%, and later on, it started to decline. The second trend is the continuation of the concealment of information and the attempts to create a positive image in terms of the economic prospects on the official TV. The budget execution has been made confidential. The same was true about uh, gold reserves. The export debt uh, has definitely become worse. An interesting fact here is that even when uh, public authorities sometimes so blurb uh, some interesting numbers, those numbers disappear. The same happened with the remark of the chair of the National Bank of Belarus, Mr. Kalau, who once blurted that uh, banks have run out of the limit in terms of the NPLs that they can bear. So this message first appeared on Delta News Agency on August 4th, and then it was called from his speech. Despite the fact that the data on budget execution have been made secret or confidential, the actual budget deficit has now disappeared, which has led to two trends. Now the government is trying to close down this gap by a few methods. Two of them that I would like to mention first is the increase in taxes and um, unprovided for emission, money emission. We have been observing the increase in different taxes. This trend has become even more apparent now. Now new taxes have been introduced for the owning of the first apartment, additional taxes for mushroom gatherers, uh, taxes for border crossing, a uh, number of other additional taxes, but it cannot solve the whole problem. Out of other pro taxes, pre-existing taxes, the individual entrepreneurs now have to pay much larger tax than before. And after the statement of the ministry, these taxes are going to uh, rise up in future as well. The same would be true. About, and we are talking about rumors now the potential increase of the most important tax in Belarus, VAT tax. This uh, information first was released into the net, then it was re removed from internet, but uh, we have all reasons to believe that it will take place. And the last trend of this summer is the return to unprovided or unprotected money emission. Lukashenko recalled when he freely used this money printing instrument in the past. Now we see how the National Bank is actively um, investing funds into all sorts of um, projects. They buy foreign currency. And uh, next important channel is to do it through the issuance of the bonds of uh, development bank and uh, a new announcement was made that they're going to issue five billion dollar uh, rubles worth of more of such bonds thank you Lev. and now we're moving to the social trends and will be started by philip bekanov who in this change track was writing about the uh, trends in public opinion hello Thank you very much for giving me the floor. Dear colleagues, I have prepared a small presentation for you to make it more user-friendly for all of us. It is just four slides, so don't be scared by that. 
please confirm that you can see everything on my screen. Yes, we can see everything. Very good. But then, first of all, I must say that just like Pavel and Artyom, I am going to speak about of only of what happened in mid July because um, we were doing our polls in June, and uh, the my report contains, of course, more detailed description of uh, the methods of the poll, and also I'm going to use the. Uh, social conflict segmentation methodology, which uh, conditionally subdivides uh, our society into four groups in terms of the level of their trust or distrust to the official political, political regime. And these four groups will be will include the strong supporters of the regime, people prone to trust the regime, who distrust the regime, and the opponents to the regime. If you want to know exact uh, methodology how we subdivided people you can read about it in our full report text what can we see we see that whereas in the first edition of the change tracker we could uh, be talking about the initial level of trust to regime through war through the um, consequences of war and that uh, Lukashenko managed to sell to the society that it could have been worse without us. Despite all of this, we see that in the next quarter, there is no such dynamics observed. And as a result, the proportions of the groups uh, that I mentioned previously remain largely unchanged. The same would be true about the social attitude indicators. They are no longer growing. In other words, we can voice an idea that the regime has run out to a certain extent or has exhausted the reserve of the neutral part of the site. If nothing terrible happens in the future, if, some, if everything continues the way it does at the moment, it is it will be foolhardy for the regime to expect any increase in its support. What can we see? We see that the indices started to go down already. We already observed this trend. And if it continues next time, then we can say that it's um, it's an overall decline. As I mentioned previously, the increase in the support is interconnected with the support of the war. And my colleagues from the Chatham House are saying that the Russians are supporting a Russian uh, actions less and less because they start uh, getting access to more unbiased information, seeing and reading about uh, some of the failures of the Russian army. So it's unlikely that uh, their support of the Russian war will increase because it's uh, even rhetoric support is unlikely here. Moving on now, what is the next salient point of my overview? This conflict has either already transformed or is actively transforming into not only a political conflict, but also a social conflict. How can we tell so? We can tell so by seeing the level of engagement in the, the Russian system. What do I mean here? The system is the set of practices or all sorts of uh, awards that a Belarusian or benefits that the Belarusian government can share with the society. It can be something real or some kind of preferences and something intangible. The level of engagement, when I speak about the engagement, it is measured not uh, by some physical terms, but rather whether a person feels itself or himself or herself a beneficiary of the existing system. How can we say that it works like this? When we divide the index, the index of social attitude or social perception into smaller indices like um, the family index, the state index or government index, the expectation index, 
and governance index, we see that, or authorities index, we see that people in the ranks of the supporters of the regime, they see optimism, or rather they're tapping the optimism for their future from certain state-run institutions. In other words, they expect that the state as a system can, one way or another, improve their condition or the overall situation in the country. Whereas people who are prone to distrust to the government or who are opponents to the state regime, they, first of all, are dissatisfied or provide low estimates to the situation in Ukraine. On the other hand, they have no hope vested in the government. They rather uh, trust in themselves and their own families, which fully coincides with what Chatham House did a few months ago. They asked the question whether you feel that the state is supporting or protecting your interests, or can you feel that this is your government? And their segment, the uh, core of the protest, uh, are people who are against the government. Neutrals is the mixture, mixture between the two segments and the bastion of Lukashenko, as it is called here, are the people who we call here ardent supporters of the Lukashenko regime. And here again, we can see that uh, the core of the protest do not consider the government to be their government. And the neutrals are in the, between their only the bastion of Lukashenko was fully satisfied with how the government represented their interests, which is a telltale sign of the transformation of the conflict into a social conflict based on these indicators. Later on, we can clearly see that the social groups and political groups that uh, we have sorted out here from larger to smaller ones, from uh, the protest group, people who are strong protesters, who feel, who are those people? They're uh, ardent uh, protesters or opponents to Lukashenko, Catholics, uh, people who are against the Ukrainian war. These people are beyond the level of tolerance of those people who are prone to trust the government or who are ardent supporters of Lukashenko. In other words, we can say that there's no longer a political opposition here. It is something else now. Now, this conflict that we're witnessing is showing a real polarization of the two groups among the ardent supporters and ardent opponents of Lukashenko. It is growing stronger and more dramatic and the war in Ukraine is uh, making it even more manifest. It is it fully coincides with the overall picture and it start, starts to bubble and boil already. Why is it important? Because just like my colleagues have already outlined, we have had a full shift of the paradigm in terms of the support of uh, law enforcement actions. What we have added here, it is not a trivial thing, not, not the most trivial thing, so I'm going to explain to you what is shown here. First, we need to understand that, okay, forget it. We have asked two questions and I've subdivided our sampling into two parts. One sample group was asked one question that on 7th and 9th August, Vilnius hosted the Conference of Belarusian Democratic Forces, New Belarus, and one of the themes of the discussion was the uh, how to dethrone Lukashenko by force. Of course, maybe uh, participants of this conference did not use these exact words, but uh, between the lines, that's what was implied. That's why we have formulated it like this, and we have asked the question, do you think that you would have supported or not such a forceful removal of Lukashenko from power? For the second sample group, we have phrased the question differently. We said that we have asked them to tr imagine what a, a person or somebody close to them or just the person they know, know, like mother, father, their friend, anyone, anybody. And by answering the following question, we asked them to think about that person who they imagined, and we asked them the question, 
in a different formulation, whether the person that you think about would have supported such a forceful removal from power uh, question. And see, here we have somewhat different answers. And now I'm going to interpret them. The actual proposition we as researchers interpret as agreement with this um, proposition can be interpreted as agreement with a proactive, more forceful actions uh, towards the removal of Lukashenko from power. I guess in spring 2020, Chatham House published a report which didn't have exactly the same question, but rather it was formulated quite in quite a, a detail so we can compare it. It was they also contain an option with a proactive uh, forceful protest and its popularity was 4.5 percent only. Here we see that in the segment of ardent opponents of Lukashenko, absolute majority of them would have supported such forceful uh, violent measures. In among the people who are prone to distrust the inertia of the old uh, narrative that said protest must be peaceful is still strong, but again, they are close to turning it over because the proactive question and its or rather proactive answer to the question can be articulated in two ways. First, is that the those people who are answering this question, they think that their friends or family members would have supported it. Already about half of them have answered like this, which leads to a certain formation of consensus. And a different interpretation is, is the reduction of the influence of the fear factor, because it's quite a uh, fearful question to answer, right? And here again, we have less number of uh, people who were prone to answer it proactively because the number of people think that their friends might not be such radically set as themselves. And we see these two groups. I'm sorry, Philip. I, I just have 30 seconds of your time. Okay, here we can see that these two groups together account for about 40-50% of the support of such a proactive forceful or a violent, if you will, method of removal of Lukashenko from power. And we think that such a, the, the nominations uh, of law enforcers into the Tikhanovsky cabinet is the just a timely response to the demands of the protest-oriented part of the society. And considering what, when we see that the conflict is being transformed from political to social one, it shows uh, quite a serious uh, change over in our society. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. It was very interesting indeed. And uh, finally, I'm giving the floor to Gennad Korshinov, who is going to speak about regime and societal relations more time. Hello, dear friends. I'm happy to talk to you today. I'm going to speak about the principal trends that we see in the relationship between the government and the society and the uh, civil society in general. Naturally, here, as previous speaker said, we look only at the summer period, but the trends are quite typical for other periods as well. It all started, I'd say, in springtime, because the principal factor both then and in summer and nowadays still remains to be the war factor. No matter what people are saying, no matter how strongly we argue about whether Belarus is active participant or not, still war works. We can see it in economics, in politics, and in the relations between the government and the society. We can see it, first of all, because the repressions that we had are having now and will continue uh, really have become more militarized. What do I mean here? It means that the authorities have included into their agenda not only prosecution by political uh, intentions, which continues as we can see, but also 
more military intentions. It has been seen through the waves of repressions and big arrests uh, that uh, we could observe in Dragician, Koniki, Zlobin, Pruzhany, Pinsk, the southern part of Belarus. The civil rights activists are saying that those people had uh, no other previous arrests, but still, as Artyom said, it's more like another attempt to put more pressure on activists at that moment in time to make sure that no information is uh, fed to Gayud, for instance, to put more pressure or suppress uh, potential cyber uh, partisans. Another trend of militarization, uh, the demonstrative prosecutions of those uh, volunteers who fight on the side of Ukraine. Of course, it didn't start in 2022. It has started ever since 2014. But that prosecution now is not only demonstrative, it was also preventive in nature because they were detecting, apprehending, and arresting people, only, only those people who were just voicing their intent to participate in the uh, Russo-Ukrainian war. Another trend is the prosecution of, of one's own people, basically, or, or rather the uh, relatives relatives, relatives of Kalinovsky uh, regiment, for instance, when they uh, arrested uh, mother of Vasily Parfenkov and uh, Mr. Prokhorov, and their mothers were forced to apologize in front of the camera. And then mother and uh, the daughter were arrested. And then other relatives of Kalinovsky regiment were uh, prosecuted. But the same prosecution was used not only against Ukrainian volunteers, but also against the whole range of political activists and simple Belarusians who were arrested before that, starting from the mother of Anton Matulka and uh, parents of Alina Brubas, who is a journalist. I can add here that some intermediary resume or uh, an intermediary conclusion about the repressions, personalized repressions. Repressions are not going down in intensity, although some people are being released from prison. Their prison terms are uh, coming to an end, or some people are pardoned. But even if we look at the dynamics of political prisoners, uh, these numbers are growing. The repressions can be seen not only against individual persons, but also some strata of people. Now we see a very strong trend uh, in terms of pacification of profession, professional field. In the summertime, the whole sector of trade unions has been destroyed. Not only the Belarusian trade unions, or rather trade union movement was not destroyed only in Belarus, but there were some attempts to influence foreign trade unions as well. For instance, KGB recognized the trade union of Belarusians of UK has been recognized as extremist uh, formation. Of course, they cannot reach out and uh, pressurize them. But regardless, in the professional field, Belarus is creating new conditions to make sure that the whole professions would feel what it's like to have a ban slapped against it. Journalists know very well what I'm talking about here. Expert society community knows what I'm talking about. So basically, the same trend is spreading out actively. Some professions feel it very strongly, like teachers, for instance. And because we already see huge shortage among teachers in Belarus, and uh, and another less pronounced, but also quite, quite well felt level of control and the pressure on medical professionals. This 
Oh, I'm talking about the control not only over professional fields uh, against uh, professionals who have grown in these professional communities, but also we see some military controllers or curators. Now we have such military curators over culture, uh, education, and so on and so forth. A separate direction, which causes a lot of uh, problems in Belarus and outside, is the Belarusization of the military memory. Now, anything Belarusian is being eradicated and destroyed from different sectors, starting from daily things and ending with the culture and education. As far as the culture was concerned that Artyom spoke about, that the tourism sector, what people heard about our uh, touring or tourist guides are uh, pressurized and institutional structures uh, who were created to promote Belarusian culture, like uh, unofficial publishing houses, uh, Galiaf and others. And also we see a ban on access to digital resources. Like for instance, there was such a telegram channel where Diprasvet and other self-publishing houses were concentrated. Again, it was destroyed. Another thing to put a final finer point on it would be the wa wars of memory or wars with memory. It's a contentious issue whether it was a real command issued to executive committees or it was just an initiative of ardent Lukashenko supporters driven by their own consciousness, but it led to the destruction of Polish uh, graves, first of all, in the Grodno region of Belarus. To summarize, considering all this level of pressure and repressions that have been all over Belarus and all over civil society in Belarus, civil society continues to exist, although acting guerrilla style now. We see that maybe it's not at the height of its development, but the horizontal connections and the civil connections continue to survive. How that can it happen? First of all, there is a strengthening of own moral right and victory, that we have the right for that, that what I'm doing is good and it gives me belief in the uh, victory very soon. Secondly, there is a higher level of experience now how to exist and survive under extreme uh, situation. Uh, hopefully it will continue in future as well. The third is of course the digital way of publishing information, digital way of keeping information and exchange information. Here we expect that what Pavel Lieber said, there's a possibility of creating a joint platform, a digital platform that would be able to join and accumulate uh, the work made by the civil society and reach the new level. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Gennady. And now we move to the Q&A session. Before we start, I would like to announce to the participants of discussion that the second report is available at the Friedrich Ebert Foundation website. At the end of the today's session, we'll send in the chat the link uh, to this document and we'll uh, also send it to everyone who registered for this event. Those of you who are with us in Zoom, you're welcome to, to ask questions using your voice we can organize that. The only thing, the only caveat here is that I would prioritize the questions uh, that directly touch upon the Belarusian tracker of changes, even though it may be difficult. We already had some questions before the beginning of our discussion. Uh, I'd like to address the question to Pavel Slunkin, 
I'll switch to English now and read in English. If you're in the Russian channel, you will hear the voice of the interpreter who will translate the questions into Russian language. Can you discuss any implications from the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit and the upgrading of the relationship with Beijing to all weather comprehensive strategic partnership? And I want to address this question to Pavel. Thank you very much, Anton. Thank you for this question. Honestly, I would not really uh, focus too much on this organization, on this summit. Very often, Belarusian Russian propagandists try to portray it as the organization that uh, is an alternative to the NATO, or as Alexander Lukashenko said, it could be uh, an alternative to the United Nations. These are propagandist uh, stamps and propagandist voices that uh, are very far-fetched. Basically, this organization, the Shanghai organization, is more about economic cooperation between countries and Belarus is not a member. He has, it has not been admitted yet and the process. This process may take up to a year or more. Therefore, I wouldn't really focus too much on that. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't make uh, uh, any conclusions here, long lasting conclusions, particularly when it comes to those and Chinese relationship. If there's any progress, it should be marked in economic terms or some political steps that would show to us that Beijing is providing broad uh, assistance to Belarus. And uh, since 2020, we have witnessed in, in, in another effect. So this all weather relationship is basically pure talk. Of course, in the conditions of isolation and international isolation in particular from the Western countries, Belarus and the Belarusian regime simply has to present this and to portray this as the great victory. If we look at the Belarusian foreign ministry, they presented this in their social feeds as the new level of diplomatic relationship between Belarus and China. I believe it, this is a nonsense. So the relationship can be at the level of the ambassadors or charge d'affaires, but uh, I don't know what they mean by this. So I don't think we should focus on this rhetoric too much. I think we should follow the economic figures and uh, the events as they develop. So far, we didn't have uh, any uh, conclusions and any confirmations of this big breakthrough. And we know that China has uh, uh, very often good relations and big relations with everyone, at least uh, it sounds like this. Uh, question to Philip Bikano from Yuri de Kachrust. Why the question uh, about the support of the military actions is uh, in the three groups that you asked this about is uh, lower than in other parts of the survey. Thank you, Yuri, for this question. It's quite easy. I'll show you the slide once again. I don't know if you can see it. We only see the black screen. Unfortunately, I have a, no laptop. So we can see. Let, uh, let's say a few words about how we interpreted these answers. We have here three ways of interpreting uh, responses. Those who are in involved in the system are uh, eager to support it. The neutral responses, neutral may come from the people who may be afraid to answer otherwise. We always say that we always try to mitigate these responses 
and single out uh, its effects and its influence on the overall result. This question is quite sensitive. Therefore, we decided to acknowledge uh, what our Kiev's, Kiev uh, friends said about the uh, territorial questions. So we used it to bring down, to mitigate the sensitivity, to bring down the sensitivity. And we see the difference here. One of the interpretations for the neutral segments is the bringing down the sensitivity. So when people in such cases say what, what they really believe, what is prevalent in their rambler. Secondly, for this very group, uh, we can think that there can be some paranoid, un paranoid answers. And people think that there are some remains of, of enemy that needs to be destroyed. A similar thing may happen here. Respondents may think that there are more people with the alternative views than they believe, than staunch supporters believe. But again, the fall in sensitivity may also take place. I've already said that it's either bring down the sensitivity of the questions or the fact that there, uh, we witness a paradigm shift. It's, it's immaterial whether this one or another sensitivity issue or the environment. And it's still the formation of the new consensus among the people who are not included in the system. As far as the staunch opponents are concerned, these people are much more radical in their support than their surroundings or their environment or the community. So there was a narrative saying that the protest must be peaceful because there were only 4.5 percent who supported the proactive support. So the peaceful protest lasted for a long time and many people believe that there are a lot of people who didn't would not have supported the more active approach. The inertia of this peaceful process explains why there are fewer people that support the active steps. They believe that among their community members, fewer people would support the forceful protest. Thank you very much, Philip. Fine. So, Philip, one more question to you from Regor Astapenia. Could you tell us more about the family index, the expectation index, and other indices that you uh, prepared solely for this research? Thank you. It wasn't me who came up with them. It was uh, made by Livada, Russian agency, a long time ago. We're just using them in order to follow the track the dynamics because we believe that and it's a very good way of doing this and to describe the situation the indices well i can answer briefly because if we go deeper there are 14 questions that uh, indices are made of and it's actually described in detail in our report in the written copy so i'll be brief so that you will understand what it's about there are there is a general index, index index of social mood, consisting of four parts, index of the family. It's a subjective emotional responses. In the next index of the well-being of the country, country's well-being, um, something like that. This index describes the evaluation of the economic and political status of a state of the country. So it's more about the country. The next index of um, expectations is more about the future. 
about the country, what the, the country should expect, what will happen with the country in the near term. And the power index in our survey, in our research, is the less valuable index because more than other indices, it's influenced by the the fear factor because there the level of the influence of Lukashenko and his apparatus plays a major role. Together they play a, a role that can be interpreted in uh, different ways. In my research I interpreted it to understand there's a discrepancy. Segments that are prone to changes have their family index lower than any other indices touching upon the state. And those who are in another camp, they have uh, generally lower figures. So basically they think that it's not great in the country, but their family indices are higher than that uh, with pro-country index. In order to feel the support in the future, they're looking uh, for support in, among the community members and their family and their neighbors. So we interpret this as the involvement, non-involvement in the Belarusian system. I suggest everybody reads the text by the Russian sociologist Pastuchov in September 2020. And we thought it was uh, uh, talking some strange stuff, but uh, he was looking into the future, actually. Thank you, Philippe. The next question to all the speakers that came to us before the presentation started, what are the changes in the trends compared to the previous quarter? Let's be brief and start in the same order. Pavel, please. In my presentation, I said that many trends, they uh, remain the same, like the external attention or perception of Belarus. In other words, people thinking that Belarus is more and more associated with Lukashenko, not, not individual actor. The fact that the, there's a trend to support Ukraine and the Kremlin narratives. So I would single out three major trends, but I suggest that those who are interested in that would read uh, the research paper and find the answers to your question there. Thank you, Pavel. The same question, Artem. Just like Pavel, I spoke about this in my presentation. I have ta two trends that uh, continued from the previous, maybe three, continued um, one concerning the powers. One of the trends is peaked and uh, now it's down, it's like activization of the second echelon of the opposition forces. With so the culmination of the uh, the power struggle of, of the first and second echelon of democratic forces, and the, both in media and reality, the second echelon became more active. Katerina, please. I also said that the, some obvious things continue. It's obvious that economic cooperation with the EU is uh, going down 
because all the sanctions uh, that were imposed, they came into force. And now only alternative shipments can provide for growth and contribute to growth. Of course, there's uh, nothing serious. If there's nothing serious happening in the political front, as far as the relationship with Russia is concerned, it uh, was easy to predict when uh, Russia remains our main hope. There could be no quality changes. The export that's going to Russia and it's increased cannot be explained by the major achievements. But it was interesting to see and expected to see that Belarus managed to find, find some alternative routes for potassium shipments and some long-term ways of bypassing sanctions as far as the oil processing, oil products are concerned. Next, Lev, please. Uh, the same uh, with me uh, in terms of trends. Uh, I uh, noted there was a decline, which has newer quality trends, meaning that the IT sphere would not be the driver of the Belarusian economic growth. 8% was growth in June, plus 1% in July, minus 8%. In August, I think it was minus 3%. So this is the uh, quality change. The information was hidden in by the authorities before. Still, the tempo of the hiding of economic uh, information they became stronger this summer the, the same trend we observe with the increase of taxes the emission is growing it started in the spring even uh, a year ago but uh, now there are many more talks about the mission and uh, the objective data about the emission shows that the emission grew manifold. Philippe, please be brief. The colleagues are saying that the trends continue and I noticed my trends end. In the past, we saw that uh, there was growing support to regime and now we see that uh, it, it, never, it doesn't grow anymore. Well, it looks like we're there if there's no awful thing happening like the atomic bomb exploding or something like that. I don't think that uh, without major change in the policies, the Russian regime will probably not find more support among the neutral group of people and among the staunch op opponents. I don't think he will never find more support. Thank you very much, Gennady. I'll be brief. As far as the relationship between the society and the state is concerned, there are many trends, but the state is com continuing the repressions, involving more and more people in this repressive machine. And the scale on the other hand, the, the society have this resistance and they're looking for ways to uh, resist this repression coming from the state. Thank you, Gennady. And the question to you, do the expert monitor uh, the situation with the vulnerable groups of people inside of Belarus, like uh, uh, all the people uh, and other vulnerable groups, the disabled people and so on and so forth. And if if so, why not? No, we don't monitor the situations because the, there are simple reasons for that. One reason is that basically the civil society will 
almost destroyed, particularly the foundations and institutions that this way or another supported and helped such vulnerable groups or monitored their status. Secondly, the human rights defenders that are still in Belarus uh, and still working with Belarus cannot cover fully this issue because we don't know the full list of people who were sentenced um, by political motives or people do not take risks to provide information about the pressure that they sustain. In other words, there are no institutions that would uh, uh, do it and the people would not disclose information of this kind to the human rights defenders. The question from the chat to Philip, do I understand it right from the graph that 6% of the Lukashenko proponents would also support the him being overthrown? If so, isn't it contradictory? How do you explain this? Well, in fact, I uh, was quite uh, perplexed when I saw such figures, but as far as I understand it, it doesn't mean that we collected the bad, dead, bad data. It's the only thing that surprises us when we analyze all the data. We didn't see any of the curious things. How can this be explained? First and foremost, we can imagine that somebody believes that if the proponents of the protest take to the streets, there will be a casus belli. Or maybe somebody misinterpreted the question. We don't have this in our uh, printed report. We had a question when we tried to understand the trend when the people who are staunch supporters of Lukashenko regime, they perceive all the ideas as being oppositional because we asked them whether this or that event happened and they said no this does not happen because they perceive those events as bad ones so which means that they don't really understand sometimes what the, we ask them about so this is a non-relevant 100 percent non-relevant question as far as Lukashenko's support is concerned, when people come across such questions, many things may happen. Maybe this misinterpreted, like I said, because when we put this question in the survey, we didn't plan to analyze the staunch supporters of Lukashenko in this respect. So it's interesting to see the the results of the projective questions. But as I said, anything I just said could be the reason for this such response. Like, this, the first thing is discrepancy in the data. And this number of people doesn't really fit in the logic of the, our survey. So I'm confident about our data. So. So as I said, there could be one of the few things that influ influenced such response. Thank you, Philip. We're done with questions that uh, relate to the Belarusian tracker of changes. Therefore, um, since we have the crime to the crime of the Belarusian analyst, we'll now ask you questions that we have received. Another question from the chat. What is the situation 
with Russians who tried to avoid being mobilized uh, and that came to Belarus. Maybe some of you know what is happening with the Russian citizens who are trying to escape mobilization came to Belarus for this purpose. Well, I guess they're hiding now. Well, I think the question shouldn't be addressed to us because we're not Russians and we're not now in Belarus. So it's, it's impossible for us to understand what they have in their heads. I don't know if the question uh, about, about what's in their heads or add the attitude towards them. Maybe we should research this question further because I don't know what will happen with them in Belarus, governed by Lukashenko's regime. How Belarusians will treat them, how Belarusian regime will treat them is a big mystery. Thank you very much. So the, your answer is that nobody knows. The news that we all read show, uh, shows that the, some people who are trying to avoid or escape being mobilized in Russia are going to Belarus and there's information about them being taken off the trains, which means that Belarus may not be the place for hiding, place of hiding for them. So basically it shows what the Belarusian authorities think about such people, how they treat them. Thank you very much. Question from Volga Simashka. And Artyom, we'll start with Artyom. What awaits the OS? Uh, CSTO and the EU? That's a very broad question, talking about the context of war. Uh, and uh, uh, there is, of course, some cooling of relationship from the Central Asian countries and from the Caucasus countries, which is obvious. At the same time, it doesn't mean that formally the structures are on the verge of some breakup or disintegration, because the authoritarian and democratic leaders of the post-Soviet space are very careful about that. Because for them, uh, we, they see that inside the CSTO there are some military conflicts. And uh, there's no much reaction no, from the part of uh, the CSTO. And as soon as Russia, or until Russia becomes for the states, becomes a direct military foreign policy threat, based on the experience of the post-Soviet space, uh, despite all the cooling of relations, these countries will not crush and uh, disintegrate what is happening. The major example is that in the CIS is still we see Moldova that is moving towards uh, Europe and only Georgia and Ukraine. And I'm not sh sure if Ukraine's formalized the process of leaving this CIS. And the Georgia did that after they started war with, they had war with Russia. And from the point of view of losing the internal sense, this process, especially in the case of CSTO, has been launched a while ago and is reconfirmed again at this moment in time. I guess that Eurasian Economic Union, considering the economic pit that uh, Russia is plummeting into, can expect the same thing. Thank you. Pavel, would you like to add something to what Artyom said? Well, in fact, I fully agree with Artyom. I just think it is important to note here when we speak about the fate, we need to specify the terms. Uh, when we speak about long term, then of course it, it is predetermined by what this Russo-Ukrainian war would 
end with and the war against the international relations and the attempts of the uh, Moscow or Kremlin to change the well-established international system. And But if we speak that this, say this war will, if we look at this war uh, in short term, that it will end uh, rather sooner than later, then the answer can be different. And Artyom has largely answered this. I can uh, re-underline to say that uh, that most of the organizations are monocentric. And uh, this organization, CSTO, is, of course, uh, centered around the Russian authorities and the uh, fate of such organizations will largely depend on the influence of Russia on the neighboring countries. That is why now we can observe the trend that these organizations are losing their powers along the lines of uh, Russia losing its ground on the military fronts when, on the one hand, Russia cannot help Armenia, although it has some sign agreement with this country, and it will continue this trend. But at the same time, we need to keep in mind that even after the Soviet Union fell apart, we still had a different formation formed after that, the Commonwealth of Independent States. So basically, these organizations might survive under a different title in future. Thank you very much, Pavel. Now I would like to address the next question to Valeria. So I'm not sure that Valeria is available, unfortunately. Okay, then. That's true. Valeria is no longer with us, so we can continue without her. Okay, colleagues. In principle, we have run out of the questions that uh, I could read from chat box. And uh, as far as other questions about the Russian change track are concerned. So basically, we can call it a day now and wrap it up. I would like to remind you that the report, the second report, or rather, the second edition of the Russian change tracker can be found on the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung webpage. And uh, we are going to share this report with everyone who has signed in for today's event. I would like to thank everyone for participating. If you're watching us on the web uh, page of Press Club, please give us likes and leave your comments. Thank you very much. See you next time.